We went off to Panton Hill at one stage that morning and um, looking at the streets, all that was left was ruins of houses and mailboxes and people wandering around like there was just devastation. It was like somebody dropped a, a bomb like in Hiroshima, you know, it was that that uh, revealing and, you know, just to look at people and see them wandering around with no, just the thought of devastation and, you know, what they'd lost and things like that. So it really started the night before, Black Saturday. We were all terribly worried that, you know, things were exactly right for a uh, fire to come along and uh, be quite disastrous. So on the Friday night, um, I was ringing up people and sort of saying, well, if you're thinking about leaving, tomorrow's probably a really good idea. You could tell straight away in the morning that the temperature was incredibly hot by seven, eight, nine o'clock in the morning um, to the point where we kind of thought it was only a matter of time before things really went disastrous. And over at, uh, at Kilmore, you could see the smoke from the fire when it first started. And uh, so I decided to uh, roll on back to the folks place down the hill here and, um, and uh, just do a bit of give them a bit of a hand just in case the fire came this way and and so that's how I ended up down here. Drove down the, down the highway. It was a pretty eerie day. There was no cars on the road and windy as windy can be. There was crews who in our strike team, or we had a, multiple strike teams over Hillsville that particular day, they'd sent two of the strike teams off to a fire over the other side of the Dandenongs and then um, we were left with basically two strike teams to look after the valley at this end. We then headed up the hill from train track to the top where we could see out above and all we could see is this shower of fire basically raining down through the paddocks and just heading up into the distance. And it was just like a, a cloud of, you know, meteors hitting the ground. And um, then all of a sudden the fire would just take off and into the distance and then when we had that wind change direction, everything just turned on itself and started to burn, up, burn unburnt ground in the other direction. We effectively knew that, you know, from listening to the radio, that the fires were coming through at any rate, uh, certainly coming this direction. And uh, I'm guessing, I don't know, maybe maybe an hour before the fire front did hit, I guess we have been showered in debris, you know, embers and, you know, bits of burning leaves and all sorts of stuff. So it was... We're kind of getting showered in that. What happens is it becomes all very overwhelming. Um, when you've got such a, a big fire that's occurring, um, you, you, you reason with yourself that you actually can't stop it. And you reason with yourself that the reality is, is if it's running and you're never going to stop that front. It's just too quick, too fast, too intense. And to send people on the front line to stop ahead of a fire is just, you know, suicide. It's as simple as that. But the front that day was, you know, probably 10, 15, 30, 40 kilometres wide and just travelling so quickly that it was just unpreventable. So when a fire actually sweeps through at that such a quick speed, you know, it would have shot through here at probably, you know, within a minute or two and it would have been gone past, but the devastation that left in its wake is um, just uh, enormous. I honestly don't know what time the fires came through. It, it turned from daylight to darkness, due, obviously due to the uh, smoke. Um, so I'm guessing that's mid to late afternoon, not something like that. So it's certainly a, a long time of, you know, in the smoke uh, and in the heat. Uh, we had, um, it was just constantly doing rounds of the, of the house, you know. There was only, uh, there was the three of us, me and my old man and, uh, and my mother. I remember it was really noisy though. It was, it was quite noisy, probably. I mean, I couldn't, I had to shout for my father to hear me when he was only 
10 or 15 feet from me. So it was, and you can imagine how noisy that would be. It's just crackling sticks and just a fair roar to it. stage I saw an elderly gentleman and he was bending over and he picked up a ring off the ground and um, he said oh I said oh what you find and he said oh I found a ring and I said oh right okay I said is it something to do you know with your family or whatever and he said yeah it's my wife's and I said oh right I said did she lose it and he said no she was wearing it <clears throat> and I said oh right I said I was so sorry you know so the reality for some people was, you know, very shocking and very in your face. You um, <clears throat> kind of feel for people. Well, the next day when you woke up and uh, and everything was just ash and sticks standing, there's no no trees with leaves or or anything. It was just the ground was ash, and it took us. Oh, nearly a day just to cut ourselves out of the driveway by, but, um, you know, with the amount of trees that were down. We went up to Drew's to see if, uh, you know, see if anyone had been up there, but but that was just a smouldering, yeah, you know, mess. It was devastating. It was. To lose your dogs and your house and everything you built, <coughs> everything towards is, um, I guess you spend your whole life doing these things and you build your life and then in an instant you lose it, which is hard to deal with, <coughs> um, but you know, you cope with it and you you know, you move on, I guess. But I decided to bring my wife up here probably two or three days later. Uh, she wanted to have a look and see what was around and what wasn't. Um, so we came and had a look at what was here and the kids were curious as well, so we brought them up and um, yeah, they were quite devastated, you know, what they'd lost as well. And I think the stark reality of seeing everything burnt and whatever is a bit of a, you know, reality check for everyone. We survived it once, we should be right. If it ever came again, it's a matter of preparation really. We we knew how much preparation we had down there, so we figured, oh, well, it's, as long as we set up the place that we're building well enough, uh, we shouldn't have any drama at all, really. Yeah, so, <clears throat> of course, we had nowhere to go straight after the fires because there was nothing left on the property, so we had nowhere to put anything, store anything. Had nothing to store anyway, <laughs> so it didn't really matter that much. Um, from that perspective. Uh, so we moved into, friends of ours had a bed and breakfast and they said, oh, you know, you can stay here for a while and we rented that place off them. Uh, and within that 12 month period, we rebuilt a shed back on the property and uh, on the anniversary of Black Saturday, we moved back in on the same weekend, 12 months later into a shed and uh, lived in there and sort of had a caravan pushed in there for the three boys and uh, Sharon and I just had a bed basically behind a wall, really. And we set up the barbecue, which was our kitchen for 12 months, and we had a portable toilet and a portable shower. And that was life while we started to rebuild. So it made us stronger and it brought us closer together. Uh, we basically dealt with the situation together with our children and uh, we made a family decision to rebuild on the property. 
and uh, stay in the area. I think that's what you're really trying to strive for is just having a normal lifestyle again. And, um, you know, yeah, it was, it was a relief. And it was like a weight was lifted off my shoulders, to be honest with you, because you're the one sort of building the, the place. And, uh, yeah, look, you know, it took a lot of pressure off me, you know, once we'd moved into the house, that's for sure, which was good, <laughs> really good. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's um, a continuous thing, you know, it just goes on.